Monsignor Mannion, I want to welcome you to Voice of the Vatican. We are delighted to Thank have you, you Ashley. Us today. Happy to be here. Monsignor, you, of course, came to Rome for the canonization of Mother Teresa, who is not only a hero of the faith, but also a close friend of yours, going all the way back to 1969. Will you tell us about how that friendship began? I was volunteering as a student for North American College uh, in the Baracca of Rome, area called Prenestina. Very, very poor people in the 60s and 70s. Uh, struggling to survive in these little corrugated huts. And uh, people there said they swore to Indiana. The Indian sisters are here, we have to meet them. So within a month or two, I met them. And it was not too long after that that Sister Victoria, who I saw today at the convent, uh, said, mother's coming in to Rome, uh, she needs a ride. And I said, my motorcycle. And she said, no. She says she has a broken rib. She normally takes a bus, but we want to get her a ride this time. So I said, okay. So on that given night before, I knocked on Bishop Hickey's door, our rector, later Archbishop Cardinal in Washington, and I said, Bishop, can I borrow your car tomorrow? I have to pick up some nun at the airport. So I borrowed his car, his driver, and picked up Mother Teresa. We got to the convent at Torre Fiscali, another very poor section of Rome, and Mother said, well, we need a priest tomorrow. And I said, I'm not ordained yet. And she said, can you get us a priest? So that night I knocked again on the bishop's door and I said, Bishop, I need your car tomorrow again, but I need you in it at about 5.30 or 6 to go and say mass for these sisters and their superior that just came in from Rome, Mother Teresa. She says, okay. So we went, and they really hit it off. Beautiful conversation. And that continued to unfold through the years to when he was Archbishop Cardinal of Washington. He made sure there were five or six homes of Mother Teresa in his archdiocese. Homes for AIDS and homeless, homes for unwed mothers, contemplative home for prayer. And that's how the whole thing unfolded. Beautiful. And did you and Mother maintain contact over those years? Yeah, through the years in Rome, uh, of course, she was going to come to my ordination at St. Peter's and she didn't make it because she was up in England. And when I got to England, and this sister said to me, uh, Michael, if you look on that table over there, South Hall, England, London, uh, there's a picture for you. Mother never lets her picture be taken for anybody personal. But she had this picture taken and she wrote a note on the back for Jesus, be all, be a good priest. I still have that photo and that note in the back. Monsignor, how did the virtue of Mother Teresa inspire your own priesthood? An inspiration and a challenge. A mother was someone that had God's gift to comfort us more afflicted and to afflict us if we get too comfortable. <laughs> Always with a heart of love. But, uh, you know, it might seem strange to say this, but Mother believed that what she was doing in one way or fashion, everybody could do. And people say, no, no, no. But she believed that by the grace of Christ, and I call it Galatians 2 syndrome, I no longer live, Christ lives in me, that everybody has a way to serve the poor. And in some cases, the poor live in very wealthy homes with significant zip codes and nice cars in their garage. And I said to her once, when I was in Calcutta, Mother, do you think I should stay here? And she says, no, go back to America. There's more poverty there. And she was thinking of a spiritual poverty. And I thought of that years later when I had been in campus ministry for about 20 years plus in three different campuses in Washington and New Jersey. Every semester, two or three attempted suicides and sometimes successful ones. And when I was in Calcutta, Salt Lake Five, Bangladesh War, 500,000 people, I think we had one suicide. It really says a lot about the spiritual poverty that she spoke about yeah, so many times. Yeah, she knew it firsthand. Yes. 
Monsignor, you have done quite a bit of work in your local community, especially with outreach to the community. And I understand that you collaborate with local authorities, also the FBI. Would you tell us about your work? It's all ministry. And the ministry has various outreaches for me. Uh, perhaps the core of it is youth retreats, high school, college retreats years ago. Uh, did a lot of work years ago and now in post-abortion healing. And Mother Teresa heard one of those talks and she asked me to write it up. And that was, I think, maybe the first book on the market in post-abortion healing in, in 1985, Abortion and Healing, A Cry to Be Whole. That came from my experience of thousands of kids on retreats, many of whom had abortions. It taught me, besides what I read and studied about trauma, but it taught me about pain and hurt and suffering. And it taught me that the author of life is the one who must heal the loss of life. And in terms of abortion, it taught me that um, abortion is really violence masquerading as compassion. Through that experience, believe it or not, I saw parallels in law enforcement work because I was asked to teach and be a chaplain at our Camden County Police Academy in New Jersey. I was then asked to be chaplain for a Camden County Police Department prosecutor's office and then the state police. And then a couple of years ago, the FBI called me and said, this is the FBI. And I said, I didn't do it. <laughs> and they said, we hope you will. Would you come talk to us? And that led to a very extensive background check and finally receiving word from Washington that I was asked to be the chaplain for the Philadelphia Division of the FBI. And I found that a lot of what I learned from young people, college, married, all sorts of walks of life pertain to those under a lot of stress and hurt who had experienced violent loss who would experience suicide in friends and loved ones, fellow officers, friends, family. And so then also the U.S. Marshals involved in some of their in-services and things. And I see it all as a parish without boundaries, not designated by geographical boundaries as necessary as they sometimes are, but designated by groups of people and their loved ones and loved ones and loved ones and friends and neighbors who say, can we talk to you? We have something we want to share. And to be able in the midst of that, to be a person, as I would call it, of compassion and conviction without condemnation and condonement. The world, especially in pertaining to the Catholic Church, wants to paint us into the corner of um, condemnation. You Catholics, you don't like abortion, you must hate aborted women. You don't like gay marriage, you must hate gays. They try to paint us with that horrible, broad brush. Or um, condemnation or condonement. Oh, abortion's no big deal. Oh, euthanasia's no big deal. It's happened all the time. So between condemnation and condonement lies compassion and conviction. If I said to a woman now, who might be in her 40s or 50s, that I knew when she was 25, and she went through hell with her abortion, trying to deal with the pain of it and, the, and everything that goes with it and the, and the loss of life, knowing that the author of life is the one who must heal the loss of life. If I said to her, you know, Cindy, 30 years ago you had that abortion. Uh, now I know it was no big deal. She would say to me, Father Mike, why are you patronizing my pain? You know what I went through. I denied it. I drank a little too much. I was promiscuous. I got involved in some drugs. I did everything I could to hide it when I finally faced it. And I thought facing it would kill me. Through the life of Jesus in me, it saved me. So Father Mike, why now, quote unquote, would you patronize my pain when you knew how tough it was to find Jesus through it? And so I'm able to take some of those insights that those people taught me and the gospels I try to read 
with some understanding of how it applies to me rather than judging others and what Jesus wants of me with the gifts and talents I have and the gifts and talents I don't have and how he wants me to use them in a way that can help other people. And of course, I, I think about Mother Teresa and the 28 years I knew her. Not so much, oh my God, this is Mother Teresa, is that wonderful? People would walk up to her and say, oh, Mother, you were saying, she'd say, oh, would I die? You know, she never took herself that seriously. And not to be uh, disrespectful, but in some ways, I guess I didn't either, because she didn't want to be a plastic saint. She never wanted to do uh, pictures and videos and stuff. She, she wanted one-to-one, -one, you know? She wanted one-to-one -one touching lives and hearts. I no longer live, Christ lives in me. And I find it, you know, in law enforcement, I try to tell them, as Cardinal Hickey said years ago, we don't help people because they're Catholic. We help them because we are. Exactly. And that's so important in law enforcement. I don't know when I first meet an officer, an agent, um, if that person is Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, or somewhere in between or nowhere. All I know is that my call is to tell them that they matter, Jesus loves them, and whatever I can do to help them live that out, I'll be happy to. And of course, that idea of the boundaryless parish is something that we're hearing again and again from our Holy Father, Pope Francis, mm -hmm. who's encouraging all to go out to the mm -hmm. and to remember, as you're saying, to preach to all who are all sons and daughters mm -hmm. of God. Monsignor, would you talk to us a little bit about the, the Safe Fugitive Program? Oh. And why it is that fugitives would feel comfortable to come to Well, a U.S. Marshal in Southern Ohio, who I believe is still there in that position, Peter Elliott, had a horrible experience years ago that one of his um, marshals was murdered serving a warrant. And he said, there's got to be something we can do to help prevent this <clears throat> without compromising our responsibility. And so we talked to our U.S. Marshal in New Jersey, Jim Plosis, who is on this pilgrimage arrives tomorrow, I believe. And uh, Jim proposed that we do it in Camden, New Jersey. And so we got some ministers together and about 12 law enforcement agencies. And we got permission from the Chief Justice of our Supreme Court. And at that time, from our uh, U.S. Attorney, Chris, uh, Chris Christie, now governor. And we rolled out a safe surrender for Camden. And we told people one-to-one -one in groups, wherever we could find him, uh, this is not amnesty, this is consideration. And so in a given four-day period, rain, sleet, snow, we had everything but a volcano or earthquake, 6,000 guys lined up with their families, crypts and bloods and everybody in between, and they surrendered. And uh, it was funny, the first day they were <clears throat> looking from behind the walls of buildings across the street or two blocks down. Jorge went in, is he coming out? Sure. Lee went in, is he coming out? And there was a minimal number of people that were incarcerated. Some of the judges heard the stories and had tears in their eyes. One guy was in a wheelchair, had a leg amputated two weeks before, and he told a friend of mine, Push me through the snow. I want to get to that safe surrender. Another guy robbed a bank 20 years before and he flew in from Paris. Oh. So I'm not saying it was a panacea for crime, but I am saying we will never know how many officers were not shot because of that program. We had guys that didn't have warrants on them that were carrying guns uh, concealed that were ready to shoot somebody if somebody tried to arrest them. They weren't wanted, right. but they thought they were. We guys had warrants that went back decades, so. How is it that you were able to bring Christ to them? I think um, bringing Christ to them was the experience of um, Francis of Assisi, always preach the gospel, and when necessary, use words. We did it in the Baptist church. A friend of mine who's a Baptist minister, a black Baptist minister, John Parker, if there's ever a saint, it's him. Six foot two without the cowboy hat, 
And he tells everybody in Camden I'm his brother from another mother. <laughs> and instead of the cathedral, I was rector. I thought it would be better doing his church, more in the heart of the difficult areas. And it worked out great. Now, evaluate it now. I don't know how many recidivisms, uh, how many people uh, did not take it seriously, went through the process, uh, it got some kind of uh, consideration, and went back into the crime scene. I don't have stats on that. All I can say is that a lot of lives were touched. And it wasn't a political process. It was a process on a one-to-one -one experience of people that were looking to have a start over in their lives. We say often, I can't get a second chance at a first impression. We gave them a second chance at a second impression. Praise God. And Monsignor, you do quite a bit of work with community relations as well in the Diocese of Camden. Try to. Yes. So what does that mean? How are you able to help the community and the Diocese it, it's, of It's not about me. That's the first thing I have to really stress. It's not about me. It's a team of networking. I have a meeting in my office once a month. Could be 10 people, could be eight people, could be 30 people. Uh, law enforcement, corporate, business, educational and they each share the gifts and talents they have, the resources they bring to the table, and we try to identify who's fallen between the cracks. We have a lot of families in Camden whose kids have been murdered. Uh, we had an eight-year-old girl last week. There was uh, two gangs having a gun battle across the street, and uh, she ran and didn't make it and took a bullet in the back of the head. Another second, she would have had a line of fire. And uh, three days later, they couldn't remove the bullet. She died. And so it's keeping in touch with those families. You know, first there's the big um, press thing and the outrage and the marches. And then there's um, the trial. And sometimes kids have been attacked and assaulted. And the guy will not admit he did it. And they got to take it to trial. And the young woman is on the stand with the cameras in front of a nation reliving it for the sake of the conviction. Uh, and so then that fades and there's another murder and another, another, and what happened to that first family? Oh yeah, they're still aching. It's been two years, it's been three years, it's been five, it's 10 years since their child's been murdered. They're still aching. We're, we're not doing enough. We have to do a lot more, all of us. And all I try to do is encourage people to use gifts and talents. And there's a lot of people doing a lot more in Camden than I am, trust me. I'm just one spokesperson and one individual that tries to light a candle in the darkness instead of just cursing. And that is something that Mother Teresa did so well, isn't it, yeah. Monsignor? That's true. Monsignor, as we prepare to finish our time together, what, what is it that you would say that you would want the world to know and to understand about Mother Teresa, about who she was, about her virtues? She's a great role model. She did things in her life that as a child, I have no doubt she would have said, Lord, I can't do that. I'm not able to do that. I'm too shy to do this. I don't have the ability to do this. And yet, step by step, God gave her the grace. And a vision said, would you refuse me this when she was afraid? That train to Darjeeling? And then she said, I'll refuse you nothing, Lord. It took her to a dark night of the soul. You can't say, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. Palm Sunday, give me the palms. Holy Thursday, great bread. Thanks for the wine. Uh, Jesus, can we skip that good Friday and just go right to Easter? You can't say, I'm going to follow Jesus. And not like a Baptist minister said one time, look good on wood. If you're going to follow Jesus, you got to look good on wood. You know, so that was, that was her message. And so many before her, the Padre Pius, the Francis of Assisi's, and Mother Teresa would say, open your heart to the gifts God's given you. Be a pencil in God's hand. This interview is not about me. And in a real sense, it's not about Mother Teresa. It's about Jesus calling her in a way that's a tremendous example to the world. And me calling me as a priest in a little town like Camden in a way that can make a difference with all my sinfulness and all my faults and failures. You know, can we together do something beautiful for God? Let's do that one, Senior. 
Thank you so much for being with us here today on Voice of the Vatican. And thank you for sharing your special, intimate moments of friendship with Mother, with our audience today. Okay, thousands of people knew her better than me. I just happened to be the one at this time in this place doing a couple interviews, but there's many more people out there who have great stories and we have to encourage them to share them. Monsignor, God bless you and your ministry. Thank you. Thank you.